Okay, we're going to continue with our discussion of momentum methods for particles. Uh, this is just going to talk about impact. Think of this as collision between particles. Could be billiard balls, could be balls of clay, whatever. Um, this is section 5-2 in the text. So um, one thing that I'll note, this says a note to me actually that um, this is equivalent of two 50-minute class periods. I'm going to go through this in one shot, but I'm going to skip a bunch of slides. There's some derivations in here. Uh, you can download the slides and go through them carefully if you want, but really what I care about is that you be able to apply the techniques discussed here, and so I'm going to fly through some of the derivations a little bit. All right, so we want to study this theory of impacts. Um, and we're going to do this both for soft objects and very hard objects, and we'll see how the analysis differs. All right, so first of all, the way to think of this, um, we're going to talk about elastic and plastic collisions. In an elastic collision, think of it like two billiard balls colliding. There's no energy loss. They just um, rebound off each other in an elastic fashion. Uh, but if you replace those billiard balls with two soft chunks of clay, then as they collide, they'll stick together and travel together. And so that's what's called a perfectly plastic collision, where after the collision, the bodies stick and move as one body. Um, and so we're going to be able to study actually anything between perfectly plastic and perfectly elastic, and we'll see how you do that. Uh, the main thing uh, to note here is that there's a lot of complicated physics during the collision, and we're basically going to ignore that. So we're going to uh, worry about what happens right before the collision and right after and not deal with how we get from the before to after situation. Okay, so as a model, think of two cars, car A traveling in the same direction as car B, and A is going faster than B, so at some point A will overtake B and hit it, and then uh, the collision between A and B will add a little bit of extra energy to B and reduce the energy of A a little bit, and so that's kind of the classic collision that we need to be able to address, and the way you address it depends to some degree on whether they stick together or rebound elastically or somewhere in between. Um, so you can draw free body diagrams for these objects. We're going to ignore the vertical stuff because in this case we're assuming the cars are on the road to start and finish on the road. So during the collision you'd have these equal and opposite forces P that are affecting the two and the collision will occur over some time period and those forces will be time dependent. It gets complicated, but if you just worry about before and after, then it's not so bad. If we uh, look at this collision as perfectly plastic, that is the cars sticking together afterwards, and that would be the question. is If you know the initial velocities of the two cars, then after the collision they stick together, what's the final velocity? And you can do that just with conservation of momentum. All right, So we write a momentum balance here. Uh, VAX minus is the collision of car A right before the collision. VAX plus is the velocity of car A right after the collision. And similar for B, VB minus and VB plus. So the mass of A times VAX minus is the momentum of car A right before the collision. Uh, this is momentum of car B right before the collision. And then these last two terms are the momentum of A and B right after the collision collision. And since there's no external forces on those in the x direction, then momentum is conserved for the system in the x direction, and this balance holds. Right? So these terms over here on the left are known, the masses are known, so this has two unknowns and one equation, so we need another equation to solve them, but since the collision is assumed to be plastic and they stick together, they have the same final velocity. So you set these two equal, you substitute that in here, and you can solve for that final velocity. Um, so you do that and you get a, a, an equation like this for the final velocity of the two objects. It's a weighted average of the initial velocities weighted by the masses. So we can do an example. We can assume that car A weighs 1,200 kilograms, car B 950, and we um, assume the initial velocity of car A is 18.1 meters per second, 
car B is 14 meters per second, so car A is moving 4.1 meters per second faster than B, so it overtakes it at some time. You have a collision, they stick together, what's the final velocity? All right, so then these next few slides talk about these impulsive forces. I just don't want to worry about it. Like I say, we're ignoring what happens during the collision and just looking at what happens before and after. This talks about how if you assume the collision is instantaneous, then the forces have to be infinite to have any effect, you know, but really the collision isn't instantaneous. It takes some finite period of time, so the forces aren't infinite. I think it's not worth worrying about. Okay, you can download the slides and look at them if you want. Okay, now, um, that was for a perfectly plastic collision. The question is, what happens if they rebound from each other? Either like billiard balls where they rebound perfectly and there's no, no energy loss, or something in between where there's a little permanent deformation, a little bit of energy loss during the collision, but the the balls rebound afterwards. Um, and the way you handle problems like that is with what's called the coefficient of restitution. So for two material bodies colliding, there is a coefficient of re restitution that defines whether you're perfectly plastic, which would be a coefficient of restitution of zero, or perfectly elastic, where it's one, or somewhere in between, where it's somewhere between zero and one. Okay, and the the this comes about because it's it's been noticed over time that the rebound depends on the approach velocity that is the relative velocity between the two objects for the car problem it was the relative velocity was 4.1 meters so it's kind of the rate at which they're approaching each other that affects the collision so the coefficient of restitution is defined around that and it says that the separation velocity that is the relative velocity after the collision is a function of the approach velocity the relative velocity before the collision so if you do experiments, then you find uh, if you plot separation velocity versus approach velocity before and after a collision, it's linear for some time period, and then it goes nonlinear. So over this linear period, you can just define the slope of that line to be the coefficient of restitution, and that tells you uh, where you are relative to um, elastic versus plastic. All right, so if E is zero, if the slope of that is zero, then th that means the separation velocity is zero, and they've stuck together, and that's perfectly plastic. If E is one, then that means this is a 45-degree a, um, a angle, and the separation velocity equals the approach velocity, and that's perfectly elastic. So keep in mind, this coefficient of restitution, which we'll call little e, uh, is not a function of either of the materials is a function of the two materials. So the two materials together have between them, uh, you know, they sort of share a coefficient of restitution E. And if you change one material and not the other, then E will change, all right? And E tells us the ratio between the separation velocity and the approach velocity. And as long as we're, we're in the linear part of that um, curve we saw on the, on the previous slide, then we can say that the separation velocity divided by the approach velocity is a constant, that's E, and the separation velocity is the final velocity for a collision like this, is the final relative velocity in the x direction, that is VBX minus VAX, and the approach velocity is the initial VAX minus VBX, right? And so this ratio is a constant for two given materials, and it's E, and if we know that, then then we can combine that with conservation of momentum to solve the problem. And as I said before, E is between 0 and 1. Okay, um, I've said all this. Um, the next few slides, again, just try to address coefficient restitution in terms of the physics of what goes on during the collision. Uh, I'm going to skip that. So, um, this concept, along with co uh, cons conservation of momentum, is all we need to solve most problems. Uh, but there's something else we have to deal with, and that's called the line of impact. All right. So uh, this is uh, a billiard ball problem. So suppose uh, one billiard ball approaches another on some line. It has a perfect strike, and that second ball continues on 
uh, along the same line. That line for that kind of collision is called the line of impact. And then this plane that's kind of drawn in here, which is tangent to the contact point, is called the, um, you know, is called, is, is perpendicular. I guess that's the best thing to say. This plane, which is tangent to the contact point, is perpendicular to the line of impact. So if I have a, a yellow ball traveling along this line, striking the red ball, and the red ball continues on, then this y-axis here is the line of impact. All right? Um, this will come into play when we don't have a direct hit, when the balls kind of scatter off on different directions, and then this line of impact becomes very important. Because, for example, uh, m things like momentum conservation will be different in the y-axis, y-direction relative to the x-direction, and we'll see that. Okay. Um, so there's something called a central impact. So an impact is central if the line of impact goes through the center of mass of the two bodies. That's just like the problem we've been talking about. Okay. So that means, uh, in this case, ball A is is traveling on the y-axis, and after the collision, both balls will stay on the y-axis. Uh, but if the collision is eccentric, then um, that won't necessarily be the case. And the way to think of that is, suppose uh, ball A was a little bit off to this side in the negative x direction. Then as it traveled along this line, it would hit not straight on, but a little crooked, and it would scatter off that way, and ball B would scatter off that way. Not only would you miss, but the physics is different. So that would be an eccentric impact. Okay. So there's kind of four possibilities, all right, in, in this kind of problem. Uh, the pre-impact velocities can be parallel to the line of impact, the y-axis y in this case. And uh, the center of masses can also lie on that line of impact. And in that case, it's a direct central hit. And both balls will always re will remain on that y-axis, all right? Another option is that the velocity is parallel but the center of masses don't lie on that line, okay? So now um, we'll have an eccentric hit and we'll scatter off in a funny direction like we talked about before, okay? So that's a direct eccentric hit. Then there's a, a case where the pre-impact velocities are not parallel to the line of impact and the center of masses, but the center of masses are on the line of impact and that's an oblique central hit. And then not parallel, not on line of axis, is oblique eccentric. All right? So there's all these different cases. Um, an oblique central is like this, where the initial velocities are not parallel to the line of axis, which is the y-axis here, the line of impact. So the line of impact in this case is the y-axis, same here. Uh, but the, um, the pre-impact velocities are not parallel to that y-axis, right? These are coming in at different directions, but they hit in just such a way that it's a, it's a central impact, so this is oblique central. Right? Then we have constraints. Sometimes one of the bodies is constrained after or before the collision, and, and sometimes it's not. I would say that we probably encounter unconstrained problems more than constrained problems, okay? So in this case, uh, this is unconstrained direct central impact. So um, the the velocities are parallel to the line of impact, and so are the center of masses. Okay, this gives you 1D motion, all the motions along the y-axis. Uh, the impact forces um, only affect that motion. Okay, so to solve a problem like that, you conserve momentum in the y direction, and then you write this coefficient of restitution equation in the y direction and that gives you two equations of two unknowns you can solve for the final velocities based on that. Okay so suppose we switch to an unconstrained oblique central impact so now again the impact the line of impact is on the y-axis because just as they impact each other then the tangent to the contact line point is the x-axis, so the perpendicular to that is the y-axis, and the y-axis forms the line of impact. So even though the initial velocities aren't parallel to the y-axis, the line of impact does act as the 
axis. So the way this works is momentum is conserved in the y direction, okay, because there's no external forces in the y direction. But what's interesting is that the velocity of the um, ball A is unchanged before and after in the x direction, that is perpendicular to the line of impact. So the way to think of this is think of these balls as being frictionless. And so as they hit, there's no force in the x direction on ball A. Uh, and so there's no change in velocity along the x-axis for ball A. So before and after, the x velocity of ball A is constant. Same happens for B. And what's important is that the collision can be assumed to act along the line of impact. So we only write the coefficient of restitution along that line of impact. Right, and so um, now we have four unknowns. We have the initial velocity, or excuse me, the final velocities of each ball in the x direction, and the final velocities of each ball in the y direction. And um, so there's four unknowns, and there's four equations here, and so we have enough to solve the problem. And by varying e from zero to one, we can vary from fully plastic contact to fully elastic. Okay, so as I said, if it's perfectly plastic, you just set equal to e equal to zero, and then you can you know that the uh, velocities of a and b are the same in the x direction and in the y direction because they're totally stuck together, and um, that gives you enough to solve for those final velocities, the x velocities and the y velocities of the objects. Uh, we haven't addressed energy here, um, but there is, a, in theory, a difference in kinetic energy before and after for the system. And that's because um, energy is absorbed when two plastic bodies collide. There's some deformation there. That's a loss of kinetic energy. It's turned into deformation and heat. And so we do often lose kinetic energy uh, in a collision, um, specifically when E is less than 1. Now, uh, both those things we just discussed, those collisions were unconstrained collisions. Here's an example of a constrained collision. We have a truck traveling in the negative x direction, a car traveling in the uh, positive x direction, and they have a collision, and you'll notice the key here is that the bumpers are effectively at different height. So when this truck hits the car, the, there's going to be a force um, that pushes uh, the truck up. So the truck will want to ride up the car and there's a force pushing down, pushing the car down, right? The truck as they collide tries to force the car down, but the car can't go down because the road is assumed to be rigid. So that's the constraint. The constraint on car B comes because there's no vertical motion allowed in B because the road is assumed to be rigid. So that's where this constraint comes from. It's not a free collision. If these were in a vac or in space, let's say, and had this collision, then there'd be no constraint. The car would just go scattering off down this way. Um, but now there is a constraint, and so you've got to address that. And again, it just uh, affects which direction the momentum is conserved, which direction the coefficient of restitution is written down, that sort of thing. And we'll see how that works as we do an example later. Okay, and so the 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 key to this is that you have to address this on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, if you think of the x direction, these two objects are moving in the x direction and there's no friction assumed. And so there's no forces on the system in the x direction. So momentum is always conserved. No matter what happens in this collision, momentum is conserved in the x direction as long as there's no external forces. So we write a momentum conservation in the x direction. right? Now if we focus on the truck, since the truck is going to be uh, have a collision and be forced up. There's no constraint vertically. So um, if we if we draw um, a Q axis, which is right here, perpendicular to the line of impact, right? So the line of impact is here. Uh, the perpendicular to that is assumed to be the Q axis. And if you look along the Q axis, since there's no friction between these two bodies, there's no forces on the truck in those ac in that axis, and so there's no change in the in the velocity along the Q axis for the truck. 
That's not true of the car because as the car gets forced down, there's a normal force up. The normal force has a component in the Q direction. So there is a force on the car in the Q direction. So we can't write an equation like this in the Q direction. All right, and then we can resolve um, these equations into uh, components uh, in the x and y direction, specifically this one. We can write this, instead of having a velocity in the q direction, we can write its components in the x and y direction. And this equation becomes this equation written in terms of x and y direction instead of that previous one. Okay. So that gives us two equations, momentum con conservation in x, and then um, no change in velocity along q for the truck. We need two more equations. Uh, one is the constraint equation. So the car can't move in the y direction, so that velocity has to be 0. And the fourth equation is the coefficient of restitution equation. And that will let us solve for the two final velocities in the x and y direction for the truck in the car. Now, the um, coefficient of restitution, we always write along the line of impact. All right, so we write this coefficient of restitution equation along that line. And then we resolve that into horizontal and vertical components. And that gives us our fourth equation. We can solve that for the four unknowns. All right, so. That's a quick run through for all the kinds of cases you can, well, for the major cases you run into in doing problems like this. So let's do some examples. So the first one is a fairly simple one. It's a bowling ball return. Ball, ball B is stationary. Ball A comes in with a velocity VA. It's going to hit that ball, and the ball B is going to rebound. If this is an elastic collision, and A and B are the same weight, Ball A would stop, ball B would continue with VA. Uh, but it's not. We assume there's a coefficient of restitution of 0.98. And also, ball A is lighter than ball B. So you would expect ball A to bounce backwards since it's lighter, right? If B were infinite mass, ball A would just bounce straight back. Uh, so we, since A is lighter, we'd expect a little of negative velocity after the collision. So it's 1D horizontal motion. And we solve it that way. We balance momentum in the x direction. We write the coefficient of restitution equation in the x direction. We know our initial velocities. A moves at 6 feet per second. B moves at 0. It's stationary. And it lets us solve. And we see, indeed, that ball A does bounce backwards a little bit, half a foot per second. And ball B continues on with nearly the same velocity that A had initially. It went from 6 for ball A to 5.33 for ball B. Next, let's let's look at an air hockey uh, problem. So we've got, right, air hockey is this game you play on a table where there's a floating puck and you hit it with a mallet and try to score a goal. So the idea is that the puck is is sliding right at us it's object B, just a little plastic disc, and it's moving with VB. And you have your hand on this, and you move the mallet up at VA, right? So right before the collision, it's moving with some velocity VA. And because we're not hitting it straight on, the line of impact is rotated an angle theta from the velocity um, vectors, essentially, right? So the puck is going to come down here and then scatter off kind of in that direction or maybe back. We'll see. Uh, and then mallet B, um, we won't worry about after the collision. Okay. So um, the mallet's assumed to be um, a weight of six ounces. And uh, we do assume it's let go. Right. So our hand is off of that. If our hand stayed on, then that would be a different problem. So... Uh, we assume we sort of throw the mallet with a velocity V8 and let go. It's not really ha what happens in the game, but but that other problem is a little bit harder. So the mallet or the the mallet weighs an ounce. Uh, excuse me, the mallet weighs six ounces. The puck weighs an ounce. Okay, uh, alpha is assumed to be 40 degrees. That is this angle here. Um, the speeds are nine feet per second for the puck, 20 for the mallet question is what happens after the collision 
So the line of restitution is here, 40 degrees from, in this case, the vertical. We call the x-axis along that line of impact, the y-axis perpendicular to that. We write the coefficient of restitution equation along the x-direction. We write momentum conservation along the x-direction. And then we conserve the velocities of each body in the y-direction because there's no friction. So here it is. Here's momentum uh, conservation along the line of impact. Here's the equations that preserve the y velocities for each object individually because there's no external forces on those because there's no friction. And then here's the coefficient of restitution equation again written using the velocities along the line of impact. And notice that this is assumed to be a plastic collision which is pretty accurate for a typical air hockey game so um, the E is set to 1 and we get this. That's all we need to solve this problem. We can, um, there's a couple ways to do this. You can resolve the initial velocities into the x direction. That's how it's done here. So these are all the initial x and y velocities for each particle, for each object. We then solve and we get these um, parameters for the final velocity and we see that the kinetic energy before and after is conserved and that's typical of an elastic collision i.e. when E is 1. Okay, uh, Graphically what happens is this comes in here and scatters off this way, this comes here and scatters off that way and that's where the collision ends up. Alright now let's do this truck problem and we're going to do it two ways. One, uh, part A is if the pavement is compliant. So that way you assume the ro road is perfectly soft, provides no resistance at all. So when these two things can collide, the car can move down and it, it's as if we had a collision in space. So we're going to do the problem unconstrained. And then the, the part B is that the road is rigid and so it's constrained along the lines of what we talked about before for that problem. So the line of impact is roughly right here. It depends on the geometry of the two cars exactly, so it would be a little tricky in a real situation to find the line of impact, but we're assuming the line of impact is here at some um, angle alpha from the horizontal, and that's assumed to be known. Like I say, it depends strictly on the geometry of the car and the truck. All right, so x prime is along the line of impact, y prime is perpendicular to that, x is horizontal, y is vertical. All right, so uh, in the unconstrained case, that is the soft road, it's as if the road's not there, we're out in space, we have this collision, the car's going to go scattering off this way. We conserve momentum in the, um, along the line of impact, the x prime direction. And then there's no change in the velocities of either object individually along the y direction, y prime direction, perpendicular to the line of impact. And then we write coefficient of restitution along the line of impact. That's enough to solve this problem. So now we get um, the initial velocities, right? So the initial, the, initially the, the car is assumed to be stationary, right? So object B has zero velocity in e either direction. Uh, the truck moves it in, at negative 2.028 meters per second in the x direction. It has no vertical velocity. We can convert those into the x prime, y prime directions, get components there, and then solve all those equations we just derived. Okay, so if we do that, then we get a uh, final velocity for the truck in the negative direction of minus 1.9. Um, the x direction of the car is also negative minus 1.7. Um, the truck moves slightly vertically. The car moves pretty substantially negatively in the y direction. Okay. So for that last problem, the car is sitting there and then gets thrown down and backwards. And the truck moves up and to the left. All right. Now let's do part B where it's constrained um, impact and so the main result is that the vertical motion of B after the impact is zero. All right? So we conserve um, momentum along the x-axis. We preserve the 
yeah, x-axis, horizontal momentum. Then we preserve the velocity of y along the y prime direction or perpendicular to the line of impact, but we don't do that for the car. Remember, because there's a constraint. We write coefficient of restitution along the line of impact. Then we say that the car has no vertical motion after the collision. And um, we do this you know, by resolving components and all that. And we end up with the car moving to the left at 1.88 meters per second. Um, excuse me, the truck is 1.88 after the collision. The car is 2.05 after the collision, both to the left. And the truck has some slight vertical motion. Right, so those are just some brief examples of how to do collision problems um, using these approaches. All right.